Well, you can turn in your uh, in your Bibles to, to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. We're going to continue on our study there and uh, welcome everyone who's online. <clears throat> We're in the, the middle of a, of a passage in 2 Corinthians 11, which is the um, what's called the fool's speech. And uh, it, it's, a, it's a speech or, or a part of the passage that Paul is delivering to these Corinthians. And, and the title is not in any way to indicate that Paul was a fool because clearly he's not. He's far from it. But it's, it's earned that title because he's, he's speaking in a foolish way. Uh, and that's not like, you know, baby talk or using some weird accent. The, the foolishness is he's essentially, he's addressing these Corinthians the same way that these false shiny apostles have been uh, speaking to them. And so he's doing it by a way of comparing himself to them. And, and I think that's really critical to see that he's made this connection between um, the foolishness of comparing yourselves. Because how often have we been guilty of that? Probably every day. Every day that we're, we're kind of looking at ourselves and comparing ourselves to other people uh, in, in so many different ways, right? Comparing, comparing our looks, Maybe we are comparing our income levels or the house you live in. Uh, if it is a house, maybe it's an apartment. Uh, maybe it's the kind of job you have where you're, you're looking at other people wishing you had those things. Uh, maybe it's ministry opportunities or, or the trips that people got to go on for vacations. Single people often look to married people and they feel jealous. And married people look at single people and feel jealous. Um, you're, you're comparing how your kids are behaving based on how other kids behave. Uh, people with Fords are jealous of everyone. <laughs> even, even people with bikes, they're jealous of them because uh, they move. Um, <clears throat> but the comparison is foolish, Paul's saying. It's absolutely foolish to compare yourself in those ways, in, in those levels. Because what that does is, is the moment you compare yourself, you have a standard. Whether that's another person, whether it's your own personal standard that you're trying to measure up to, but that standard, that expectation, that's a law. And you've put yourself back under the law. You've put your back, yourself back under this system that Paul earlier in this book has said is a ministry of death and condemnation. That's the promise. It will kill you. It will make your life miserable. It will rob the joy of life and freedom from you. And so he's, he's warning against that, but yet now we find himself speaking in such a, a foolish way. And, and the reason is that he's comparing himself with these, these false apostles, these super shiny apostles, as he called them, is because he wants to meet them and defeat them essentially on their own level, kind of face them on their own turf, so to speak. And so what he, we saw last time we were in this book is that Paul was comparing their resumes, and he started off with comparing the resumes of their heritage or how they were born. He says, were they, were they Hebrews? Were they Israelites? Were they descendants of Abraham? Well, so am I. Check, check, check. Right? So that, that measures up. That doesn't mean that they had greater insight. They had greater uh, uh, prestige or, or any kind of, of special inherent value because of how they were born. It's the same. But then he's going to now compare ministry resumes. And here he says, not you know, I am also a minister of Christ. He says, I far more. As if that's crazy. He even says, it's crazy to think that I'm more of a servant of Christ because you can't be. It's, it's, a, it's a binary question. Yes or no, you are or you're not. And, but he's trying to speak to them in this foolish way. He says, I'm acting insane by saying, I'm even more of a minister of Christ, a servant of Christ. And then he goes on not to talk about the great miracles and wonders and all the fireworks that he did, but he talks about the suffering and the difficulties and the beatings that he faced and the imprisonments and how he was left for dead and, and shipwrecked and so forth. And I think he, he addresses on that point because he's contrasting himself to those false apostles. See, why did Paul face so, so much persecution? Why do you think that was? In part, because he was preaching that you're not under the law. He was preaching grace that you're freed from the law. And that's a threat to the Jews. And so they wanted you to go back under the law. And so that's why he was being persecuted. But these super shiny, eminent apostles, these false apostles, they were trying to put people back under the law. Well, now that you're saved by grace, what you need are some rules, some things to measure up to. You know, you come as you are, but now you got to do a little bit better. And so they were, they were placing them under law. So these people would never be persecuted. They were never a threat to the Jews 
because they were trying to make Christians in the Jews. And so that's why Paul is being persecuted. He's showing a contrast here because they were simply trying to put them back under the Mosaic law, even these mostly Gentile Corinthians that were never under the law, they were trying to put them under there. And so now we're going to come to this section here, and it's almost, you could almost think it could have been edited out, and you wouldn't have missed anything, right at the end of chapter 11. And yet, it's so powerful, and it's going to set us up for what's coming next as he, as he concludes this full speech in chapter 12. But what he says, what we really need to boast about, which really, if you're going to boast about anything, he says, let it be about your weakness. Let it be about the lack of strength you have. That's what we need to be boasting about. And so that's what this message is about. It's about boasting in our weakness and why that's what we're called to do rather than boasting in our strength and our accomplishments and, and all the pedigree that we may have. All right, let's pray. Father God, <clears throat> I'm excited for what you have in store because I'm feeling that weakness today. And I believe you have something special for each and every one of us that we'd find freedom and life in you. And it's it's great that we celebrated this morning and it was an incredible time of worshiping through through music. But for some people, it's hard to to experience that excitement right now because of the, the tiredness within their souls, the weakness within their body. And too often they've been shamed and put down for that. But Jesus, this morning, we're going to set them free, aren't we? Your word's going to show them that it's okay. And it's okay to embrace the weakness because that's, that's when you're going to shine. And so right now I'm embracing my weakness, my inabilities, and I'm going to trust you as best I know how this morning, Lord Jesus, so that your words would be a minister of life to each person in this room, myself included. In your name we pray, amen. <clears throat> All right, let's start in 2 Corinthians 11, beginning in verse 30. Paul here, he says, if I have to boast, if there's something you're going to make me boast about, I will boast about what pertains to my weakness. That word weakness there is asthenia in in the Greek. And it's really, it's it's the word stenia, which means strength with the letter A in front of it. And and basically that A is, is equivalent to saying without, right? So for example, you have a theist. And a theist is someone that believes in God. You put an A in front of it and you get an atheist, someone who is without the belief in God. Or you have something moral, which means it's good, it's right. You put an A in front of it. It's now without goodness. So if you serve your friend crispy bacon, that's amoral. That's without goodness. Because friends don't give friends crispy bacon, right? Turns powder in your mouth, trying to choke people. But... You might as well buy a Ford. (coughs) All right. So he says, I'm going to boast. I'm going to boast about the fact that I'm without strength. I'm going to boast about that that weakness that I have. And he knows that this is such an incredible statement that maybe they're like, oh, he's just, they're empty words. They're meaningless. So look what he says in verse 31. He says, the God of the Father, God and Father, Lord Jesus, who is blessed forever, knows that I am not lying. He's invoking an oath. He's invoking God. It's sort of like when people say today, as as God is my witness, right? Or I I swear to God that I'm telling you the truth. He knows how outlandish that statement is because it really is. It really is. Who in their right mind would ever boast about their weakness? It it doesn't seem to make sense. It doesn't seem to add up. We we would never want to do that. We always want to boast about our strength. He says, that's not the key. And then to illustrate that now, he's going to use a story. So in verses 32 and 33, he he tells us a really short story about how in Damascus, the ethnarch, which is basically the governor under Aretas, the king, was guarding the city of the Damascus, which is basically Damascus, right, in order to seize me. And I was let down on a basket through a window in the wall and so escaped his hands. Again, seems like an odd story in there, but, but I think it's a clue for us to go a little bit deeper and study the story. And so this story is actually found for us in Acts chapter 9. So I want you to turn there in your Bibles to Acts chapter 9. And and really, the story in Acts chapter 9 begins with the salvation of Paul. Where we meet him first in Acts chapter 9 is Saul. Now, it's not the first time he showed up in Luke's account. Luke had told us that when Stephen was stoned to death, Saul was there. 
and he was holding the garments of everyone that picked up the stone. So he was very much engaged, he's very much involved. Uh, but what we read here in this Acts chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, we said, Now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest. Make no mistake, there was murder in Paul's heart, at this time known as Saul. And he asked for letters from him, from the high priest, to the synagogues at Damascus, so that he, if so that if he found any belonging to the way, the way being about Jesus, right? Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and life. So if he found any Christians, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So what he's doing is he's, he was coming to the high priest, he goes, give me authority. Give me permission to go hunt down, arrest, bring back to Jerusalem for what? A party? <laughs> for punishment? Maybe retraining? Or... <laughs> feed them crispy bacon. Yeah, that would really be bad in Jews, right? But to kill them, maybe even, right? So, so I want you to think for a moment, what was, <clears throat> what was Paul's attitude, you think, in verses one and two? As, as, the, as the Saul the Pharisee, what do you think is his, he's feeling at this point? What do you think? Anger, hatred, yeah. What else? Strength. That's right. He's, he's got authority. He's not worried about anything. Self-righteous. What else? Arrogance, that pride. Feeling very powerful. He's feeling very safe, right? He's not under threat. No one's going to come after him. He's got all the authority and all the power here. And so he's not worried one bit. And so then it goes on. Now he's on the road to Damascus with all this confidence, all this hatred, all this anger, all this intimidation. And then on, in verse 8, <clears throat> uh, he, well, he has the encounter with Jesus in verse 4 where he's just kind of walking along and all of a sudden this voice, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And everyone falls down to all this. And he says, who are you, Lord? And he says, I am Jesus, the one who you are persecuting. So in verse 8 now, it says, Saul gets up from the ground. And though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. And they were leading him by hand. They brought him into Damascus. So the people who was with him now have to lead him. What do you see right away? This proud, this strong, this impressive, this arrogant man who's safe has been brought low. Can't see anymore. He doesn't know where the threats are coming from. He can't even go forward anymore on his own because he doesn't know if he'll fall or trip or he's going the right way. So he's now completely dependent on the people who have to hold his hand like a little child. And now lead him into Damascus. Immediately you see the, the fall, the humbling of Saul the Pharisee. And he meets Ananias who, who, who removes the scales off his eyes as Peter talked about last week so well. And he, he comes to faith in Jesus. And immediately, what does he begin to do? Share the gospel. No one needed to tell him. No one needed to encourage him. It was just a natural outflow, which was on his heart. So in verse 20, we can read about that. How he's immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying he is the son of God. So wherever he was going, and he started in the synagogues, because that's where the God-fearing people were. He's going there, and he's preaching the gospel to them over and over and over again. Well, what's the reaction to this? This Jew who is declared a blasphemer, this Jew who is declared to be a person non grata, who is executed and crucified, is now being declared to be the Messiah? It's so offensive to these Jews. And so they become angry and they become upset. And so we read then in verse 20, uh, uh, 22, but Saul kept increasing his strength and confounding the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Christ. From their own scriptures, he could prove it. And when, verse 23, many days had elapsed, the Jews plotted together to do away with him. And so right now they're beginning to, to plan and scheme. We gotta kill him. We gotta get rid of him. And so you notice here now, the, the hunter has become the hunted. And so word spreads to some of the people who are now learning under Paul, learning under his teaching. And, and so they decide, okay, well, we need to rescue him. And so in verse 24, it says, their plot became known to Saul. And they were also watching the gates day and night so that they might put him to death. But his disciples took him by night and led him down through an opening the wall, lowering him in a large basket. 
Now, the significance of that, I think, is, is best understood in the culture in the times. Because uh, in Roman soldiers, when you would go and invade a city, they were well fortified. They're the walls around the city. And so what they would do is they would send the Roman soldiers to climb and scale the walls. And I'm sure you've seen movies of that where they're, you know, in the medieval nights and they got the ladders and all kinds of things. But they would, they would try to scale the wall. And the, the first soldier to scale the wall was honored. It was, you get a massive award and recognition because of the bravery required for that. And so to invade a city over the wall was seen as a, as, as a very strong, powerful thing. And here you got Paul being lowered through the window in the wall. It's the exact opposite. He, he's basically owning the fact that he, he was behaving as a coward in the world's eyes. The hunted became the hunter. The persecuted became the persecuted. The strong and the powerful and the safe is now threatened and weak and vulnerable. And that was Paul every day of his life afterwards. Every day of his life afterwards, that's what he was experiencing. And so he, this, this Saul, this proud person is now humbled. And that's what he's sharing about. He says, that's what I want to boast about. I, want, I don't want to boast about all the great miraculous things I've done. I want to boast about how insignificant I am. In fact, even the name change is interesting. Saul is a very proud Jewish name, first king of Israel. But Paul means little thing, little one. And that's what he wanted. He goes, it's not about me. So he's boasting about the, the weakness. And again, it's a beautiful contrast to these flashy apostles, these false apostles who are boasting about their strength. And he says, I want to boast about my weakness. Because that's the reality of you and I, is that we are weak and limited people. Can you, can you accept that? Because too often what we do is we see our limitations, we see our weakness, and we see them as a bad thing. We see them as a fault. We see them as something inferior in us. And yet, that's the kind of person that God's looking for that he can use. It's not the strong he's looking for. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. <clears throat> so in the previous letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthians... It's sometime after Genesis, I know that. <clears throat> First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. For he says, consider your calling. Take an inventory of your skills and your abilities. Take a look at yourself. Brethren, that there are not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble. Basically saying, I am not among the 1% of the society. I'm not with the best, the best. I'm not with the brightest. I'm not with the smartest. That's not it. Verse 27, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame those which are strong. And the base things of the world and the despised God has chosen, the things that are not, so that he may fully, so he may nullify the things that are, so that no man may boast before God. He's looking for weakness. You see, think of it this way. <clears throat> what's, what's more impressive if, if a hunter kills a lion with a big 50 caliber gun? You know, the, the lion came charging at him and he's got the big 50 cal and he puts, you know, three or four shots in him and drops the lion. Or the guy that drops the lion using a pocket knife. What's more impressive? A pocket knife, right? Now, both accomplish the same purpose. They both got to that, that end goal. They dropped the lion, but... It's very different because the guy who did it with the 50 cow, well, he's got a big weapon. But the guy with the little weapon tells us more about the guy holding the weapon. Does that make sense? And so the thing is, you and I, we're like that instrument. We're like that weapon. And if you're big and strong and you do something impressive, well, yeah, no doubt. You're big and strong. You're impressive. We get it. But when you're that little pocket knife, or maybe even a little butter knife. And God's got you in his hand, and God uses that little butter knife to drop the threat. That tells us something about God. 
No one's saying, wow, what a butter knife. That was amazing. I need to get that kind of butter knife. Is it stainless steel? Oh, man, that's special. Right? That No one cares about the butter knife. We realize the strength and the power of the person holding it. And so God's looking for those weak individuals, those butter knives that he can put in his hand and he can use so that he may be glorified. Because we don't want people running to us. We want people running to Jesus. And scriptures are filled with these stories. Here's one, and you know it in, in the story of Gideon, right? In Judges chapter 7, tells the story of Gideon going to battle with the Midianites. Now, when we first meet Gideon, we meet him in, in chapter 6. And, and he's a coward, which is interesting because even God calls him a mighty warrior, but he's a coward. And I say that because he was in a wine press, in a pit, threshing wheat, now, why is that significant? Well, what you would do when you were threshing wheat, you would take the, the stalks and everything, the grains, you would put it on a big giant sieve and you would throw it up into the air, preferably where there's a breeze. And the breeze would come and it would sweep the chaff away and then the grain would just fall down. And you'd do that two or three times. So you would want to be on a hilltop because that's where the breeze would be the strongest. Well, he's in a pit. How much wind is blowing across the pit? Not very much. So why is he in the pit? Well, because the Midians would see if he was on a hilltop and they would see someone threshing their wheat and they'd go, oh, there's food, there's lunch. Guys, let's go. And so he's hiding because he's a coward. In fact, when the angel Lord comes to him and says, you are the one that God has chosen to lead Israel into battle to defeat the Midianites, he says, why would you ever pick me? My family is the least of all the families of my tribe. And me? I'm the least of all my brothers. I'm the runt of the runt, he's basically saying. Put another way, Gideon would be the kid that if, you know, kids were dividing up teams for sports, okay, you know, you get Norm and you get Mike and you get Marco and you're going back and forth and it's like, and you're going to get Gideon. Um, do I have to? Because he was so inferior. He was so weak. And yet this is the man that God's chosen. So Gideon, he gathers together all the fighting men of Israel. 32,000 men. It's a pretty impressive platoon. However, the army of the Midianites is innumerable, it says. Think about that. We can count to 32,000, but we cannot count that army. It's massive. It's huge. God says, it's not a fair fight. It's not a fair fight. It, Gideon, you have too many men. I'm sorry, What? Yeah, you, you have too many men. So here's what I want you to do. Uh, send some people home. And, and you can do it by basically just saying, anyone who wants to go home, free to go home. 22,000 fighting men left. 22,000 people who are afraid left, leaving only 10,000 people who want to go to war. 10,000 versus an innumerable army. What does God say? Yeah, it's still not fair. Too many men, Gideon. So there's gonna, we're going to put them through selection camp. I mean, all militaries do that, right? Where they put you through boot camp and selection camp and, and find out who the strongest and the fittest. And, and so God puts them through selection camp. I, I should put it in quotes, though, because it's, it's not about the strongest and the fittest. He just basically says, everyone go take a drink of water. And if you put your face in, go home. If you scoop it up to your mouth, you can stay. And 10,000 becomes 300. Versus how many? Innumerable. And what does God say? I know it's still not fair. So Gideon, here's what you're going to do. We need to outfit you. We need to, we need to arm you as you're about to go into battle. Everyone, all 300 of you, grab a trumpet and a torch. Those are your weapons. How are you feeling? Like, not even a butter knife? Like, come on, God, even, not even a butter knife? No, trumpet and a torch. And then he divides them up into three groups, 100, 100 people in each group. And they surround the camp at night. They blow the trumpets. They light the torch. And God causes now this innumerable army to turn on themselves. And they start killing each other. And the ones that don't get killed by, by their own cell, by their own team, their own army, they just flee and they run, being chased away by 300 people with trumpets and torches. Imagine if they're bagpipes. <laughs> <clears throat> And, and, and so who gets the glory? 
Is anyone going, wow, Gideon, you guys on the trumpets were amazing? No, it was God. It was God who got the glory. And that was the whole point of it, is so that we would recognize that in the weakness of Gideon, this coward, this runt of a runt, this someone that no one would fear, no one would look up to, would lead 300 people holding a torch and trumpet and defeat a numeral army. Look what your God can do. Or the other famous story we have is David and Goliath. Right? I mean, we know David as a mighty warrior, but at this point in the story, when he meets Goliath, he's just this little kid. He's a little kid who can't wear the armor of Saul, King Saul. It's too big on him. And even his own brothers don't, don't respect him and think much of him. And he's going up against this huge, massive giant, nine feet plus, little kid. To, to kind of put it in perspective, imagine Judah Balfour going up against a man who makes Shaquille O'Neal look small. That's what it was. The guy's twice his height, but probably about four times his size. Like he's massive. And one stone. One stone from the slingshot brings him down. Now, does anyone go, wow, what a stone. What a slingshot that was. What model is that? How can I get that one? Had nothing to do with the stone. Had nothing to do with the slingshot. Had nothing to do with David. It was God. All God needed was one person to trust him. All God needed was one person to put his faith in him. And it didn't matter his size or his strength. It was just simply David showed up. Even the most powerful man, strongest man in the Bible, who's that? Where did he get his strength from? From God. Because the moment the Holy Spirit left him, he was easily subdued, lost all his strength. It wasn't the strength of Samson. It was the strength of God in Samson. That's where it's from. And so it's not about your strength, it's about your weakness. I'm so out of depth as a pastor. I really am. I mean, I'm wired as an engineer. And if you know anything about engineers, we are not people people. We're not. We're simply not. Because people are unpredictable. There's too much chaos. We like order. We like structure. We like formulas. Right? Give me that. Give me something I can wrap my teeth around. Give me something predictable and precise. But don't give me people. And not only that, I'm incredibly shy and incredibly introverted. And I'm awkward as all get out. And, and I'm not a gifted speaker. I'm not, a, I'm not a gifted storyteller. Here's what I should be doing. I should be telling you a story right now about a time of my own failure. And I've got lots. I can tell you about when I, I crashed my race car the very first time it was ever being tested. I could talk to you about the first time I ever counseled someone and how I made a mess of things. I can tell you about when I, when, I, when I spoke at Greg and Megan's wedding. And I spoke three times too long. And there was a moment where I called Greg the wife and Megan the husband. Like, I just completely <laughs> obliterated it. I could talk all about these failures that I did. But you see, I'm not even a good storyteller about them. So I, I'm, I'm not this gifted orator. I'm, I'm not very cool or stylish. I, I wear a white shirt and everyone goes, ooh, wow, look at you, dressing up. <laughs> I'm incredibly insecure and moody. I'm constantly battling, battling shame. I'm inadequately trained. And today my head is pounding and swimming at the same time. Now, please understand, I'm not telling you any of this because I'm fishing for compliments. Because I know, and I can say this with confidence, I know what God's done through me. I know how God has blessed you either through this ministry here, teaching from the, the, the platform or meeting with you one-on-one -on -one and counseling or as a friend. I know what God's done through me. I've seen it. But please understand, if you got anything from me, it wasn't from me. It was from Jesus. And my insecurity, my battling shame, my inadequacy in being trained, all my struggles, even the wired as an engineer, my introvertedness, all of that weakness is what's good for me because it causes me to trust in Jesus. 
I know how inadequate, how little I have to offer you. And so I got to trust Jesus. And so really what happens now is, is my personal weakness allows me to access God's strength. Think about the verse that we love to quote here at New Life. Galatians 2 and verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. The old me is dead and buried. Right When when the Apostle Paul wrote those words, he was sharing his testimony. The the proud, arrogant, full of himself, powerful Saul the Pharisee was crucified and buried, no longer lives. But Christ now lives in me, this new person, the new little one called Paul, the new one called Ross that God has made, caused to be born again. That's the strength I now possess. That's the strength that you now possess because of the cross. It's no longer about what you do for him. It's about what Christ is doing through you. So we can boast about our weakness, which is glorious, because I know I'm not the only one that's weak. See, our weakness comes in many forms. There's an emotional weakness. Maybe you, you're like me and you struggle with shame and insecurity. Maybe you struggle with constant anxiety, just depression and despair. You're feeling overwhelmed. Or maybe you're also like me, you're overly sensitive at times. Or maybe you're just carrying all this hurt and pain from your past. It makes you feel very vulnerable. Maybe there's physical illnesses, physical limitations you have. We have people in our assembly who are battling cancer. Or, or, or maybe there's, there's other things you struggle with in terms of, you know, we have people who struggle with diabetes people who have had limitations in their, in their body in terms of their, how hard they can run or, or how fast they can run, or maybe they're handicapped. Or maybe you're struggling to sleep and you struggle with insomnia or heart issues or asthma. You have all kinds of physical limitations. And then there's just the messiness of our past, our past failures, our mistakes, the things that we, we think and we're haunted by and we think they probably disqualify me going forward. And then there's the things that were done to us. And together that lie comes along and says, if you only knew, if you only knew my struggles, if you only knew my failures and my inadequacies, you wouldn't want me here. You wouldn't want to sit under this teaching. You wouldn't want to be my friend. And so we all have these limitations. And it's hard to struggle. It's easy to have everything going well. It's hard to struggle with physical, emotional limitations. It's hard to struggle with the memories of your past. But I want you to know it's okay to struggle, even though the world doesn't say it's okay. You see, the world and too many of us for too long have despised our weaknesses. We've hated them, especially the weakness we see in ourselves. And it produces so much self-hatred. I mean, think about, think about the heroes of our world. Right, the, the movie stars, the Jason Momoas, right? That's Aquaman. Or you've got uh, Chris Hemsworth who plays Thor. Or Henry Cavill who plays Superman. These guys are all massive, strong men. And that's just today. Even, even you know, go back a, a generation. And when I was growing up, the heroes were like Harrison Ford and, and uh, Bruce Willis, the star of that Christmas movie, Die Hard. I mean, they weren't big, strong people, but they were heroes because they had an internal strength. And so we admired those people. Or you go back even further and, and, and you know, the John Waynes that maybe Ian would have looked up to as a kid. <laughs> Norm was Samson, right? So don't, <laughs> don't feel bad for Ian. <clears throat> or sports, right? You, anyone remember the, the, the cartoon pro stars? Michael Jordan, Bo Jackson, Wayne Gretzky. Right? They turned him into cartoon, but these guys were superstars. And even though Wayne Gretzky wasn't big, like Bo Jackson was, but they all were skilled. They were all strong. They were all powerful. And that's what the world celebrates. That's what we look up to. They're admired for their strength. No one's cheering for the weak one. No one's asking the weak person for their autograph. Even Stephen Hawkins, who when he was bound to a wheelchair, his strength was his mind. No one cares about the, the, the kid who's weak and can't do anything and just drools. And yet God can work through those people 
in so many more ways because he's not looking for the most talented, the smartest, most powerful. A verse to memorize is 2 Chronicles 16, verse 9. I think of it as God's high definition, right? 16 by 9, that was high definition. 2 Chronicles 16, 9 says that God is looking to and fro in the earth, looking for people whose hearts are turned towards him. People whose hearts fully belong to him. People who are willing to be men and women of faith. That's all he's looking for. So that he can be the strength to them. It's not about your ability. As many have said, it's about that availability. It's about that faith and that trust. And the weaker you are, the greater God's strength shows up. So if we're those people whose hearts are committed to him in anything, be it at home, be it at work, be it in terms of evangelism, be it in terms of serving in a ministry, just in terms of being a friend, driving, the, driving a car when the Ford breaks down in front of you. I don't know why I'm going after Ford today, but you know, man. Whatever it is, Jesus is in you to be available to you. And he says, I will provide the plan and I'll provide the power and I'll do it through you if you trust me. Just show up and trust me, that's it. That's all Gideon did. That's what David did. That's what Samson did. That's what Paul did. It doesn't mean that you, you don't fight against these struggles. In our home, joy struggles with insomnia. And we do everything we can to, to battle that insomnia. And we try to, to try to make it possible for her to sleep well because it's so important, it's so critical. And so we're battling against that. And if you're struggling with cancer and illness, you battle against it as best you can. But what I want us to do is to embrace the struggles. It's okay to fight against the struggles, but more importantly, it's okay to have the struggles. It's okay to boast and be glorious in those weaknesses because that weakness hopefully leads us to Jesus. Again, please understand, there's no virtue in being weak. That's not it. It's it's only half the battle. That weakness, if it points us to Jesus, that's the virtue. It's the faithfulness that's a virtue. And the weakness makes it easier to put our faith and trust in him. So what it means is to embrace the struggle because it's okay to struggle. You don't need to hide it. You don't need to pretend that everything's okay. You don't need to pretend that you're fine. You don't need to pretend that you're not going through difficult periods. It's okay to be honest and be real and be yourself. See, too often we've got this mindset, this attitude with God of like a little children. You know, little children, they're trying to do something and, and, and you want to come and help them. What do they say? I got it. I do it myself. And we're kind of that way with God. He says, trust me with this one. I know it's hard. and I know you're scared. I know it's a battle, but, but, but I got it if you'll let me. And I'm not going to do it without you. I'm going to do it with you. We'll do it together with my strength and my power because the source is coming from him. And that's the part we need to understand. That's the part we need to embrace. And that's the part that he learned about, Paul learned about. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and then we'll close. This is earlier on in his letter. And again, I want to show the theme that Paul's constantly been, been laying out for these Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians 3, beginning of verse 4, he says, Such confidence we have through Christ toward God. Not that we're adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves. I know it's not about me. Paul says it's not because I was a Pharisee and I was trained, I had all this. In fact, to the Philippians, he says it was all just rubbish. It was human waste, all that stuff. No, my adequacy is from God. Verse six, who also made us adequate as servants of a new covenant, not of the letter, not of the law, not of measuring up, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. You see, too often we thought the gospel was about come to Jesus, get your sins forgiven, and then do better going forward. It's all about you and what your efforts and what you're doing. And the gospel is about life. It's the life that God has given to you. And he gave his life. He put himself in you. He came to live in you today because he actually wants to live in you today. 
wants to live through you. And so that's what we're wanting to do, Lord Jesus. In my weakness, my lack of strength, I want to trust you to speak through me. I want to trust you to love through me. This one's important. I want to trust you to listen through me. I want you to trust me, the parent, to be a friend, to step out and take chances. Because of the life of Jesus you have inside, you can do it. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that you don't need us to be strong. Thank you it's not about us you know, getting motivated, getting, getting working ourselves up into a, into a spirit of, of, of excellence and trying harder and doing more. That's not what you need from us. Instead, what you want is for us to celebrate our weaknesses, to embrace those weaknesses. And it's hard because those weaknesses are not fun. They come at a giant cost. As Paul experienced, it wasn't easy to be beaten, to be stoned to death, to be shipwrecked. It's hard. But he boasts about those weaknesses because, Lord Jesus, that's when you were made strong through him. And we today are the beneficiaries of that strength. And now others be beneficiaries of the strength you place through us towards others. In your name we pray, amen. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that message and it blessed you as we discover more about this great life we have in Jesus. I want to encourage you to, to like and subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. And also you can check out these videos here and watch more sermons and more messages. It really will encourage you in the, the joy and the power that we have in Jesus Christ.